Hey everybody, today is Tuesday, ninth day of May 2023, and this is Out on the Town with Big Chuck from St. Charles, episode number five, and uh, I was going to be going to Boone Slick Park today, but it turns out Boone Slick Park is permanently closed, um, I didn't know that, so... I uh, had a last minute change of plans and uh, decided to come back down to uh, Main Street um, and Frontier Park, which was where I, that was where I did episode number one. But it's pretty, you know, huge area. So I came back and I went down before I was kind of like in the middle section. Now I'm kind of like in the south section, kind of like down by South Main uh, or in the south section of Frontier Park. Uh, kind of over by the uh, Lewis and Clark Boathouse. So I thought, yeah, I, I just I had a very last change plan, just very last minute. That was a, it's a really tiny park anyway. Boone Slick was so I was my kind of this was kind of my backup plan anyway. It's kind of just right down the street. Uh, so I was thinking, you know, worst case scenario, I could just go across the street and go to Mark Twain Mall, or. Um, I'll go down the street and I'd come on down here to South Main. So when I got the news that that park was closed permanently, I was like, all right, well, yeah, let's head down to South Main and uh, let's go to Lewis and Clark Boathouse. I thought that would be a cool thing to, uh, A, not only get footage for the, um, for the YouTube channel, but I'm also taking pictures for the upcoming, for the St. Charles Parks photo contest. And so I'm gonna quit. Yeah, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna be doing that. So here we are, um, the southern portion of Frontier Park. And we're gonna be checking out the Lewis and Clark Boathouse. Uh, for those of you viewers who are not natives of the area, um, yeah, Lewis and Clark is a really big deal in St. Charles. Uh, this is where they started their big expedition. Um, so it's St. Charles's big claim to fame. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, we're gonna go check that out in a little bit. But thought while I'm down this way, might as well get some shots of the river here. Uh, plus, I need to get out in the sun. It's just right on the verge, man. The weather is very strange. Uh, I would say it's probably about mid, maybe it's in the 70s, but it still feels a little cool uh, in the shade, like the breeze. It's coming out of the north or something, but you know, I don't know. This is not very, I don't know. wouldn't really take a picture of this, but it's kind of worth coming to look at. It's kind of cool. That's the majestic Missouri River, ladies and gentlemen. All right, moving on. Got some kids here. Having a field trip. Which means it's time for me to vamos. Getting out of here. Covenant Christian School. All right. Let's see what's going on over here. Yeah, there used to be a a boat over here. Uh, I think it was the. Showboat, uh, Goldenrod Showboat. They used to have like dinner, like a dinner theater type thing. Got some geese over there.
Hello. I hate sidewalks. Sidewalks are just kind of, unless I have to use them, I'd rather just use a parking lot because it's generally a, a lot smoother of a ride. So here we go. The Lewis and Clark Boathouse. So this is basically this is some kind of little museum, I guess. I've never been here. Never been. Anyway, so I'm learning more and more about these dogs, these dog statues. Uh, apparently, yeah, this was the last mayor's idea. And uh, I guess she was trying to make this more of an artsy place. I don't know. But St. Louis is already, or St. Charles, kind of an artsy, weirdo place. But anyway, I guess so she thought it'd be a cool idea to put these little dog statues in just random places all over town. And I guess it's a St. Bernard because, like, the dog that went with Lewis and Clark were, uh, was a St. Bernard. I forgot its name, but we're going to find out. I'm going to. Anyway, so these dog statues are just randomly placed throughout town. But each one of them was like $5,000. So that caused a big stink. And people say that that's probably one of the major reasons why she did not get reelected. So. All right. Moving on. So, as far as I can tell, there's really nothing here right now. Uh, it's just all closed down. There's a museum and gift shop on the upper level. Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, I will see what's going on up there. I never have an elevator. So. and Clark in St. Charles. Pardon me. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Let's see. In his journal, William Clark wrote of their arrival here, a number of spectators, French and Indians, flocked to the bank to see the party. The village is about one mile in length, situated on the north side. Oh, okay, this is a quote. Okay. In his journal, William Clark wrote of their arrival here, quote, A number of spectators, French and Indians, flocked to the bank to see the party. This village is about one mile in length, situated on the north side of the Missouri, 
at the foot of a hill from which it takes its name Petite Cote or Little Hill. Okay. That was the original name of uh, okay. Of uh, St. Charles, Petite Cote uh, or Little Hill. This village continue uh, about 100 houses, the most of them small and indifferent and about 450 inhabitants, chiefly French. These people appear poor, polite, and harmonious. The flag of 1803 with 15 stars. Oh, wow. With 15 stars and 15 stripes. I don't know if you can see that or not. Okay, that's the flag of 1803. And... This, I guess, is one of the longboats they were using. Yeah, that's what they had downstairs behind those bars. But it looked like it was closed to the public at the time. So, let's see here. So, here in St. Charles, the Corps of Volunteers for Northwest Discovery about 42 men under the command uh, of William Clark docked the keel boat and two perroques. Perroques are flat bottom rowboats with sails. St. Charles, the Corps of Volunteers for Northwest Discovery, about 42 men under the command of William Clark, docked the keelboat and two perroques. Perroques are flat bottom rowboats with sails around noon on May 16, 1804. Pierre Cruzet and Francois Labiche enlisted here. Both were renowned as boat handlers and steered the perroques on many occasions. As men of French and Omaha tribal heritage, they could also translate with fur traders and tribes along the way. Cruzat was a unique in the Corps as a man with just one good eye. He posed a risk as a hunter, but as a fiddle player, he could lift the morale and bridge cultural gaps with music. Many attended an evening celebration Three men, John Collins, William Warner, and Hugh Hall, abandoned their guard posts to join the festivities. The next day, they were court-martialed. About 20 men went to Mass at St. Charles Barmeo Catholic Church, which is still right down the street. That's where it was Saint, uh, St. Charles is named after, uh, St. Charles Barmeo. The experience, uh, well, I guess at the time it was still being called... Uh, petite coat uh, but anyway uh, so the experience was a novelty to them wrote Joseph Whitehouse Meriwether Lewis crossed over land from St. Louis in a torrential downpour joining the Corps on Sunday May 20th knowing it was the last opportunity to buy provisions and assemble the crew the Corps for the first time as one departed St. Charles on May 21 1804 the Corps returned here September 21, 1806, with Clark describing the scene. The party rejoiced at the sight of this hospitable village, plied their oars with great dexterity. We were met by great numbers of the inhabitants. We found them excessively polite. The inhabitants of this village appear much delighted at our return and seem to vie with each other in their politeness to us all. All right, so there you go, one more shot. So I'll try to get another shot. Of, they have a replica of that boat. 
downstairs. And I just kind of, I didn't even bother looking at it because it was kind of closed off to the public. But you can still see it pretty well through the, but uh, there we go. Let me see if I can get in here. Uh, see. Would you like help? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, doing pretty good. How are you doing? It's gorgeous out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't. Is, is, it, is that? I didn't knock that out of place. Did I? No, nope, it's good. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. We just have forty first graders in here. Oh, so okay. Can yeah, I saw them when they were leaving. Yeah. But as soon as can be. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. There it's Lewis and Clark. Uh, And there's that St. Bernard. So yeah, I'm thinking those statues of the St. Bernards are because of Lewis and Clark's. Uh, so I'm thinking Meriwether Lewis is the guy on the right, the fancy dressed military guy, and I think Clark is the dude on the left. Uh, yeah. I forgot the dog's name. Let me ask this lady. Hey, just out of curiosity, do you know that, what was that dog's name? That Seaman. What was it? Seaman. The dog's name was Seaman? Yeah. The, uh, uh, St. Bernard? Is that what it is? It was Newfoundland. Or Newfoundland, okay. Yeah. Well, is that what inspired all these dog statues around? It did. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, all some right. Some dogs have, or some cities have cows, some have pigs, we have Seaman. Yeah, Seaman. So how's that spelled? S E A. Oh, okay. So, uh, and what's it called? A new. F Newfoundland. Okay, a Newfoundland. Okay. Big two hundred pound dog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was. I always thought it was a Saint Bernard, but yeah, that, that makes sense. Yep. Okay, it's a Newfoundland. I kept saying it was a Saint Bernard. Seaman. It's Seaman the dog. Uh, I guess this is like one of the dudes. This would be like what one of the. Oh yeah, that was that guy I was reading about. That one eyed dude. Okay, what's this? I wish I could hear that. So, one of the tasks given to Lewis and Clark by Thomas Jefferson was surveying and mapping their route to the Pacific Ocean. Before the trip, Lewis received training for making observations and measurements needed for determining latitude and longitude. Clark made most of the distance and direction measurements. When time allowed, direction was determined with a circumferenter and distances measured with the surveys, surveyor's chain. Often though, the need to keep moving prevented such precise work. On those occasions, Clark would use a smaller pocket compass and dead reckoning, estimating the distances from point to point. Even with such rough measurements, the map produced by Clark was very accurate. I guess that's the map. Right? 
stay put. Okay, she can be. So. going on over here? Yeah. Uh, see so I wonder. So there's St. Charles right there. Uh, okay. I used to always say, alright, and then there's the confluence right there. And you got Illinois right over there. Dugout canoe. Oh, okay. We've got a dugout canoe here. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but. the dugout canoe. So let's see. Got a little bit about the dugout canoe. Uh, see. This remarkably okay. It's made of Osage orange wood. So uh, this remarkably well preserved dugout canoe offers a fascinating glimpse into trapping, hunting and exploring in Ozarks in the late 18th early 19th century. Ozarks, for those of you who are not natives to the area, yeah, that's uh, a little bit south of here. Uh, so, fortunately, okay, Ozarks, in, okay, late 18th, early 19th century. Fortunately, it was rescued from being used as a garden decoration. Huh. Thanks to Larry and Judy Sifford of Branson, West Missouri. In the early 1800s, as Lewis and Clark's huge craft navigated the Missouri River, this small dugout, uh, or one similar to it, may have been gliding along the small streams and creeks of the Ozarks in the western frontier as a musket or an axe. What? Oh no. Light enough for one man to drag over land, this canoe would have been as valuable in the western frontier as a musket or an axe. Dr. Neil Lapineau and J. Jack Ray of the Center for Archaeological Research at Missouri State University used radiocarbon dating to establish the date of construction between 1777 and 1823. 68.2% probability. The Osage orange tree from which the dugout was made was hollowed out naturally and only needed to be split into the two halves and trimmed into its final shape, making the task of working the extremely hard wood less arduous. Archaeologists noted that the dugout was likely used by early European explorers or settlers into a natural channel wait, or settlers based on the use of glue and metal nails to secure wooden plug inserts into natural channel depressions of the hollow tree. At 13 feet long, weighing 175 pounds, the dugout was purchased by Sif the Siffords in 2020. Mr. Sifford acted on a recommendation by a friend and had archaeologists confirm the age and significance of the little canoe. Placed on loan by the Larry and Judy Sifford family, Branson. West Missouri. An amazing resource. Key to the canoe's remarkable condition is Osage orange wood. 
the hardest and most naturally rot resistant lumber in North America, northwest Louisiana, southwest Arkansas. It is consistent with the pre-settlement distribution of Osage Orange from which this canoe was constructed. Notes Dr. Neil Lapinot of the Center for Archaeological Research at Missouri State University. First Encounters with the Indians, August, Sept August September 84, 84, 1804. One of President Jefferson's instructions for the expedition was to contact the various Indian tribes whose lands they would be passing through and to inform them of the changes made by the Louisiana Purchase. The first council was held on August 2nd, 1804 with the Missouri and Oto Indians. The encounter was peaceful, the peace pipe was smoked, and gifts of special metals with Jefferson's likeness on them were given along with cloth, gunpowder, and promises for more trade. The explorers were able to meet many Indian tribes on friendly terms, and the Indians were of great help to them. Along the route, Indians provided vital information acted as guides and traded for horses, which made it possible for the poor of Discovery to cross the Rocky Mountains. Okay. Fort Mandan. As winter approached, the men settled at a site across the river from the village of friendly Mandan Indians. Okay. But I could sit here and read this all day long, but... We have a, here we have a beaver. Oh my god, it's so lifelike. Uh, okay. What's going on over here? It's a cool little museum, though. Huh. What's that? Okay. I don't think I can get through right there. Some geese there, a goose, Canadian, Canadian goose, Canadian geese. Uh, got a rabbit there. Uh, here we have a fox. be a good place for a picture. We got a beaver over there making his dam. Okay, here we go. Oh I gotta set up this camera. I don't know if this counts is being part of Frontier Park or not. I'm gonna ask that lady. But if this count actually counts as being part of Frontier Park. Oh my god! Wow, you got a deer lying that right next to some... Uh, are those wolves or coyotes? I think they're coyotes. Eastern gray... Please do not touch the animals. Okay, well that's a white tail deer. Here we got our 
Whoa. Look at that. That is pretty lifelike looking. Like that one is. That one looks like it's alive. It's almost, it's almost spooky. Fishing, there you got an odd river otter. Fishing on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Almost a year to the day before the Corps of Discovery arrived in St. Charles, Meriwether Lewis purchased $25.37 worth of fishing tackle from shopkeeper George Lawton in Philadelphia, including 125 large fishing hooks and 2,800 fish hooks to present to the Indians. While fish was never a part, a favorite part of the core diet, it did provide calories and variety. Among the men, Private Silas Goodrich was the most avid fisherman, even noted for personally showing off his catch to the captains. I amused myself in fishing several hours today and caught a number of both species of the white fish, but no trout nor cat. That's Oh, that was Lewis, June 19, 1805, near Great Falls. Okay, so the captain's documented for the first time the spawning cycle of salmon. Okay, moving on. Moving on. So we're here. Okay, I guess this is Astoria. I think this is where they came out at. That's if my if memory serves. All right, thanks, you too. Healed 
boat, or I think that's what it's called. feel like 83 though right now. It's about, it's about noon. Not free, okay? So they say. Curious. I gotta see. Right, I gotta see what this is back here. Looks like. I mean, is this just where they dump the trash or what? Yeah. Okay. Just, I could guess. I'm guessing. Let's see. Yep. Just a bunch of dumpsters. Trail back here. It was leading me out, so I'll go ahead and come back this way. And so I guess now we're gonna head up to uh, South Main. Mm. Look at it's St. Charles. Look at, all, look at the patriotism on display in this town. Be good for a photograph. Big 
curb. Get up there. Oh, shit. Sorry. Ah, oh, man, there used to be a trail that went over there in the Frontier Park, but... Oh! Hello! I meant to ask that lady if that was actually part of Frontier Park. Uh... Well, I think it is. I mean, there's a trail connecting the two places. You better pay attention. I wasn't. I had a little ditch there. I was looking off over to the left. But, uh. I used to come down here a lot. It was like going back 20 years or so, but. Uh. At night, I used to come down here and do training in my manual chair. Speaking of which, a little programming note. Um, yeah, I'm not, uh, training, the training videos are, they're not, I'm taking a little break for them just for about four or five days. Uh, I might be doing it again on Friday. The problem is, uh, you know, physically I'm fine, I feel healthy, but, uh, Uh, but I'm having uh, labor problems right now. Uh, more specifically, uh, with care, I'm in between caregivers right now. And the reason I need caregivers to get in that manual chair, the manual chair sit, well, once to switch chairs, I have to actually get in bed first and then person has to move my power chair and then put my manual chair there and then so I need someone to switch the chairs and uh, if no one is there to switch the chairs then uh, I kind of can't do it I can't I can't get in the manual chair by myself so uh, until I get someone there uh, which I think someone is supposed to start on Friday, so we'll see. Today's Tuesday. So you are always welcome in Missouri State Parks. Alright. Alright, so here we are. This uh, at Boomslick and South Main. crossing here. Uh, let me see. Maybe I'll just go right here. Come on over here. Ooh. Oh yeah, I wanted to I wanted to stay in the well I can get back in I can get back in the park. Come on over here. We've got Boon Slick Trail in. I guess, I don't know, I guess this is a bed and breakfast or, or something. Uh, come on up here. So, this is Boon Slick. This is South Main. 
throw. I want to get. I want to try and get back down to the park though. So what I'm gonna do. Is come on. I'm gonna, I might come back up here later though, if I have time. But, uh, let's see here. Not 83 degrees.
All right, so today at Blanchett Park, we got the fruit trucks, food trucks, uh, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. But it's gonna be there. So here we are, Frontier Park. Like I said, I was here in week one, but uh, I didn't get to, I didn't get down to this part. Here's another picture of Lewis and Clark. Or another picture, another statue. This is the full, full, full scale model of the one we uh, saw in the museum. St. Charles and welcome travelers for well over 200 years. Okay. Captain William Clark uh, and the men of the Corps of Discovery experienced this hospitality with a ball held in their honor on the evening of May 16, 1804, as they awaited the arrival of Captain Lewis and his dog, Seaman. Okay, this monument commemorates these famous explorers as they face the unknown west in anticipation of great discoveries. to get a get it all up close and personal with the statue. Oh, wait, one second, right behind, okay, go ahead. I was hoping to be able to get a better shot, but I was almost up too close to it. Seaman, the Newfoundland. Yeah. 
a good spot for a picture. See if I can get the American flags in on that. Uh, Down that way. Decisions, decisions. I guess I'll go down here. See what's down this way. But yeah, okay, starting to finally starting to warm up nicely. Breeze is dying down, and it's feeling good. It was just, it was down like cool, man, earlier. I wasn't digging it. Now it's starting to feel pretty nice. a bridge that went right over there that would that makes things a lot more convenient but I guess they're working on that this frontier park pavilion looks like it's worth the picture why not Okay, so yeah, but anyway, it's starting to get a lot more photogenic out here now. The foliage is really starting to come out of the trees, so it's looking a lot more pretty, prettier. Uh, so, but it'll be cool when they finally start putting some. Uh, uh, flowers in the flower beds so oh Bathroom. It's 
first off and foremost importance. That's what I'm doing. Stop the cafe. Maybe get a little treat. I don't know. Maybe something like that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it's going to Okay. We've got to be back at the boathouse in two. That's an hour and a half. Not much has changed since Lewis and Clark's time as far as people are very people are still very friendly and polite right around here. Uh, almost comically so, but I don't know. It's cool, you know, could be worse. It's better than everybody being mean and grouchy, I guess. Uh, uh, Something about the place. It's enchanted. It's very beautiful. I just feel good just going out, getting out of the town. Everybody's kind of out for the same reason, just to sort of enjoy the weather. But this really isn't even that crowded of a time. Okay, I need to come down here. Okay, south King. Uh.
Oh, okay. Well, um, this is Albert Kister Park. Albert F. Kister Park. Okay. I, this park constrain, uh, constructed by the Land Clearance for Development Authority of the City of St. Charles. Okay, I guess so. I guess this counts, yeah. Park. It's very tiny. Main Street in Bloom. Room. So I'm going to put this on pause. I don't know if it's going to 